Hey everybody, so let's talk about social class. Uh, this is our first step into inequality. Um, we're gonna be spending the next few lectures talking about what, make, what makes people unequal. So when we talk about social class, we have to talk about social stratification. Essentially, social stratification means that there is a structured inequality between groups. And when we address social stratification, one of the best ways to think about this is like a ladder. So structured inequality between groups is very much uh, exemplified in a ladder because you have these different rungs on the ladder, right? So the bottom rung, you have underclass um, or people in complete poverty, working poor, middle, lower class, middle class, upper class, upper cl capitalist class. Uh, and then up here, I would put like the super rich. This is like the Oprah's of the world, right? Social class ladders are a good way to think about uh, social stratification because in theory, we're all supposed to be striving to get to the next rung on the ladder, right? And how do we do that? We do that through education, we do that through hard work, we do that through being able to advance in the workplace. Um, but you know, as most of you know, things aren't always that easy and moving your way up the ladder, what we call social mobility is really tricky uh, because um, just think about the things you need to know in order to get a promotion or the things you need to have achieved, right? If you need to have a better education, how are you going to pay for it? Um, if you need a master's degree in order to be promoted, how are you going to be able to cover that expense? Can you afford a bachelor's degree, which is what a lot of people need just to start their way up the ladder, right? Um, who do you know that can help promote you or even get you a job? So when we talk about social stratification, we think about these rungs on the ladder and what it means and, and what goes into moving up each rung uh, and what people have to be able to know or who they have to know <laughs> to get up the ladder. Now, I wanna talk about this bottom ladder, this bottom part of the ladder, which is the working poor and the underclass. So these are the 2019 um, federal poverty guidelines. This is basically um, how the federal government decides if you are living in poverty or not. And if you look over here, so you've got family size, and then if you look over here, you've got a family of four. So basically what this chart is saying is that a family of four should be able to live on $25,000 a year. And that if you are at least at that, then you're not considered poor. Um, that if you're under that, then you're considered poor. Now, I don't know about a lot of you, but I would have a hard time raising myself on $25,000 a year, um, let alone myself and three other people. Uh, this is but works out to about $2,000 a month or about $12 an hour. It's not a lot of money um, for four people to be living on. Um, so when we're talking about this ladder, um, one of the things to consider in social stratification is uh, I, I, what I've said that there are some uh, things that hinder people from moving up the ladder. Um, one of them is our own sort of idea of what poverty is or what poverty should look like. Okay, so social class and social theory. Here's how some of the social theories approach social class. So functionalist theory talks about how in the United States, we're used to seeing social class described as the elite class, right? So remember, those are the, the billionaires, the Oprah's, the Jay-Z's, the Beyonce's of the world. Um, the upper class, the middle class, and lower class, that's sort of our bar for what we think of when we think of class, st class structures. Um, functionalism says that if you uh, work hard, if you um, pr have some sort of competition, and if you're motivated, that you will be successful. And that class structure as we know it is good because it encourages people to work hard, to be motivated, and to compete for things. Um, so functionalism is very much in favor of this sort of capitalist approach to a society. Uh, conflict theory, remember we're talking about groups and we're talking about power. So conflict theory says that in order for one group to be successful, another group is going to have to fail. Um, one way to think about social class and, uh, com and conflict theory is to consider things like school systems. So if you have time, there is a documentary that came out about 10 years ago called Nursery University, and it follows groups of parents around Manhattan as they're trying to get their child into preschool. Now that is key here. We're talking about preschool, like three and four year olds, not even kindergarten, but preschool, um, nursery school, uh, and how much these parents are willing to spend in order to get their children into the ideal, perfect preschool. And what they're willing to spend is tens of thousands of dollars. One family drops $30,000 to get their three-year-old into preschool. 
I know that sounds bananas, but they do. I could do a lot with $30,000, by the way. Um, this is part of what conflict theory is getting at, that if your child is going to be successful, and um, by this in, the, in these terms, we're, we're defining success as wealthy. If your child is going to be successful and wealthy, then they need to get into the perfect preschool right now because that's the perfect elementary school, which leads to the perfect middle school or junior high, perfect high school. And then the next thing you know, everyone's off to Harvard and everything's great. You're going to have this really successful kid. This is social class and, and conflict theory. Another example of conflict theory is this guy, Martin Shkreli. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, at the In this lecture, in the module for this lecture, you're going to see a link to a video that I just labeled Martin Shkreli. Um, I want you to take a second and watch it. And then when you come back, we can all sort of have a collective ugh together over what who he is and what he did. Okay, um, I don't have any sort of cute pose, so I'll just say, pause now. Okay, welcome back. So now that you know what he did and the amount of money that he charged people for medication, um, this is conflict theory, right? This is using power in order to uh, gain more control or more power and to keep a group of people oppressed. It's also kind of exploiting our system using power. Uh, and in this case, our financial systems. Now, it should be noted that um, after he did this, um, as usually is the case, uh, IRS and um, people from the FCC came a knocking and discovered that he may not have been totally honest with some of his finances and he is in prison now. Um, but you also should know, if you did not know this, that uh, while he was using all this money and was the CEO of Turing, Turing Pharmaceuticals, he bought a Wu-Tang album that Wu-Tang only printed one copy of, and this guy bought it for like $3 million. That may be ringing some bells for some of you, because I know a lot of people were upset about that. Um, but that was the same guy. So here's these are some examples of conflict theory. Symbolic interaction when we're talking about conf or when we're talking about social class is to looks at what we call symbolic displays of wealth. So these are things that people do to make themselves seem more wealthy than they are, to make themselves seem like they have more money than they do. Um, and a lot of ways, a lot of people do this, right? Like you need to have a certain phone or computer or clothing or car or something that signals to the world, hey, I am way more wealthy than you may think I am, right? The biggest way we do this is through weddings. So just off the top of your mind, if you can think of it, what do you think the average cost of a wedding is? Just anything, any number. What's that you say? $27,800? Yeah, for sure. So the not.com, which if you're not familiar, is a big wedding website, um, says that the average wedding costs around $27,800. CNN Money messed with those numbers a little bit and came up with $21,000, but that's still, that's a lot of money. So I don't know if any of you have been involved in a wedding, have planned a wedding, have been around while a wedding was being planned, but you probably witnessed people spending a lot more money than maybe they had, maybe budgets went out the window or through the roof, um, because weddings are expensive and we use them as a symbolic display of wealth. And we use it for absolutely every single part of the wedding, whether we can afford it or not, right? So there's the question of the dress and where it, did you get it and how much was it? Where did it come from? Who made it? Um, things like the rings, the hall that you rent, the venue where you have the reception, the table settings you pick, and the flowers, and the food, and the DJ, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's even shows dedicated to um, brides and their physical appearance showing that they can afford to have some sort of plastic surgery done to them. For reference, I give you the show Bridal Plasty, which basically was where women competed for surgery and uh, brides competed for surgery. Um, and, and then at the end, they got a head to toe complete makeover. I think you can still find it on a Hulu, although I think it might make you dumb, so don't watch it. <laughs> Just know that it's out there. <sighs> All right, when we're talking about poverty, we also talk about something called the culture of poverty. And this was a term coined by a guy named Oscar Lewis. Uh, and he came up with a few points when he was talking about things that the poor have in common. Um, he said that people who are in poverty are going to develop a different way of life. And you're going to see this in the Breaking the Cycle video that you're going to watch in a little bit. 
um, how um, people sort of create their own standard of culture based off of how much income they have. Um, people in poverty tend to become used to dire circumstances. Uh, being in poverty will emphasize immediate gratification. And as a result of all of this, it becomes difficult to move out of. So this is the social mobility piece with the ladder that I was showing you in the earlier slides. All right, so feminist theory relates to poverty through something called the feminization of poverty. Basically, what this means is that women represent a disproportionate percentage of the world's poor. This is just a fact. Women more than men around the world are more likely to be living in poverty um, for tons of reasons, but it is a just a standard um, um, secure fact. Um, more than one in seven women live in poverty. Uh, women are more likely to be living below the poverty line than men across all racial and ethnic groups. And 56% um, of poor children live in families headed by women. So feminist theory would approach this through the feminization of poverty. Now, now that we're done with the lecture part. I want you to go to um, this module where you saw this lecture and watch the two videos on a global reaction to poverty and a US reaction to poverty. And I will see you soon. Bye.